This is Katya Varbanova from 20K Nation, and you are listening to the Inspiration Place podcast with Miriam Shulman. This episode is sponsored by The Artist Incubator. It's my small group coaching program where I can help you take your art business to the next level. Just imagine what it would feel like to easily be able to build your business and sell your art. I would love to help you with practical strategies so you can stop spinning and you'll know exactly what you need to do. Learning from an artist who has been there and know what works. This program is by invitation only. To apply, just go to shulmanart.com forward slash B-I-Z. The strategy session you'll get when you apply is absolutely free. You'll get some free tips from me. And if you're a right fit, I'll invite you to the program. It's the Inspiration Place podcast with artist Miriam Shulman. Welcome to the Inspiration Place podcast, an art world insider podcast for artists by an artist, where each week we go behind the scenes to uncover the perspiration and inspiration behind the art. And now, your host, Miriam Shulman. Well, hello, this is your host, Miriam Shulman, and you are listening to episode number 56 of the Inspiration Place podcast. I am so thrilled that you're here. Today, we're talking about using your psychodynamics to make your marketing messages more meaningful because I believe that the more you learn about yourself and tap into your magical powers, the more easily you'll be able to sell your art. And even if you're not interested in selling your art and you're one of my listeners who just likes to paint for fun, it's always important to learn more about yourself to reach that elusive self-acceptance. So in this episode, you'll discover how you can lean into your personality type to unlock your superpowers, how you could or should be using psychodynamics when you market your art and business, and why you should finally give yourself permission to just be yourself and why you are enough just as you are. Before I bring on today's guest and introduce her, I want to give you a little bit of a backstory. I belong to a mastermind group. A mastermind is normally a high level group of people working in the same industry as you. It could be led by a coach, which mine is, or it could be just a group of your peers that you meet together. I've been in both types of masterminds, those that I've put together myself, as well as the type where it's facilitated by a coach. So right now I'm actually in Ron Reich's mastermind. I absolutely adore it. And we meet several times a year in person. So one of the in-person events was in Medellin, Colombia. In Medellin, that is actually the birthplace of Colombian artist Botero. If you're not sure who that is, you might actually have seen his art and not realized it. He does these very large figures, both in painting and sculpture. He makes all his figures look overweight and larger than life. And he was born in Medellin and he's donated a lot of art back to his home country, which has actually helped it experience a revival in art and culture since previously it was overrun by drug lords. So my mastermind coach organized an in-person mastermind retreat in Colombia. The first few days we met in a hotel to discuss our business. We would have dinners out on the town. And at the end of the retreat, most of the people went on an exhibition into the rainforest. I decided not to go into the rainforest, which actually I I don't regret because I don't like to regret stuff, but I think next year I will add on the rainforest part. But the idea was to get out of your comfort zone because when you are in business or you're creative like we are, you always have to take risks and learning how to take risks in your life is really important. 
I chose not to do the rainforest part because it really gave my husband a lot of anxiety that, first of all, I was even going to Columbia in the first place by myself. But second of all, the idea of me going whitewater rafting and hiking and sleeping in the woods did not help my husband. So, and of course, you met my husband a couple episodes ago. He's a very compassionate person and we've been married 26 years and occasionally those of you who are married or in relationships, sometimes you have to compromise to keep the other person happy. Truth be told, I wasn't really thrilled with the idea of sleeping in the woods in a hammock since I'm a little menopausal and I just imagine myself having a hot flash in the middle of the night and falling out of my hammock. So I decided I would go on this trip anyway to Colombia, but I would skip the rainforest part of it And instead, I gave myself a beautiful day looking at art. I arranged for a driver to take me to the plaza where I could see the Botero sculptures and also visit the art museum, which has his collection. Then I also went to the botanical gardens where I had a beautiful lunch of avocado soup overlooking the gardens where I saw iguanas. I think they were iguanas or Como dragon, something of that breed. That was my beautiful mastermind. And part of the mastermind experience was that my coach invited experts in different fields to come talk to us and inspire us. And one of his guests that he had is our guest today. I don't want to give too much away. I'm about to introduce her fully. But what she inspired me was really helping me understand myself in ways I hadn't before. So we're talking today a lot about the Myers-Briggs. If you are completely unfamiliar with that, you may want to go and take the Myers-Briggs test yourself. And just to get an idea of where you're at, I want to give you a little bit of an overview on that since we don't really get into it on the show. We kind of assume you know what it is, but it measures, first of all, your degree of introvertedness or extrovertedness. And then it measures whether you are a big picture thinker or more of a detailed person. And then whether you lead by feelings or by solving problems. And then finally, it's how you organize yourself. So I've always known that I lean more toward introvertedness, that I'm a big picture thinker and I'm a strategy person. So that is the I for introverted The N is more of the big picture thinking. The T is more of a strategy person. And I always had thought that because I'm a messy, disorganized creative, that that was more of my strength, that I was an INTP. After this session, though, working with our guest today, I learned that I'm actually more of a strategist and more organized than I give myself credit for through and through. It's why I'm very organized with these podcasts. It's why I like to buy my plane tickets six months in advance. I just love self-knowledge. And if you haven't figured it out by now, this really is a very heavily leaning self-development podcast. Anything that I can bring to you to help you understand yourself better, I know is going to make you both a better artist as well as a better business person. The more we learn, the more we earn. Okay, so we're going to introduce today's guest in just a moment. But before we get there, I also wanted to tell you about how you can work with me on a more mastermind-like basis. So I don't have a mastermind per se. I'm not calling it a mastermind, but I have started a program called the Artist Incubator. And that began late in August. So right now we're recording live. This will be going live in September. So it'll be about a month in. But I do have room to take on a few more people. So if you are interested in being coached in that way, just like in my mastermind, I meet every week with my coach as well as the other members. We discuss our businesses. I get huge insights that way. And I love learning not just from the 
coach, but also from the other members. And I've created that experience as well for my artist clients. If that's something you're interested in, I still have room and I'm taking applications right now. If you want to apply, because this is by invitation only, please go to shulmanart.com forward slash B-I-Z. Now, as you'll learn today, like I said, my strengths our strategy. My strengths are big picture thinking. My strengths are teaching you how to organize things. So if those are your weaknesses, if you are more of a detailed person, if you lead more by feeling, then I'm a good person to help you because I will be able to help you with your weaknesses and really provide the strategies that will help you overcome your fears, the things that are keeping you stuck, the things that are keeping you overwhelmed. All right, so we'll talk about that more at the end. Without further ado, I want to get into today's episode. Today's guest is a video marketing expert and business strategist who helps entrepreneurs go beyond creating personal brands to achieve icon status. As the founder of 20K Nation, she teaches clients to generate at least $20,000 a month with only 20 hours of work a week. Her signature approach involves aligning her clients' Myers-Briggs personality type with their approach to business. She has worked with more than 1,300 clients, enabling many to be featured in TEDx Talks, secure book deals, and sell 100K packages. She has spoken on stages across the world, reached more than 100,000 followers through her social media channels, and appeared in publications and podcasts, including Entrepreneur and The Smartest Guys in marketing, and of course, the inspiration place. (laughs) Before starting her own business, our guest worked in marketing and brand management for nearly a decade, handling major corporate accounts. Please welcome to the inspiration place, Katya Varbanova. Well, hello, Katya. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited. We only met in person. It feels like only yesterday, but it was like weeks ago now. I met and was immediately charmed by Katya at this mastermind retreat that we did in Medellin, Colombia. And she was one of the guest experts. What you did, Katya, it was almost like having like that parlor trick. You would go around like a fortune teller. And once you knew someone's Myers-Briggs, it was like you you just completely would be able to open the book on them and say, well, you're like this and you need this and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, do me next. <laughs> do me next. <laughs> uh, so first of all, just because there may be people who are listening who don't know what we're talking about, could you just describe what the Myers-Briggs test is and why you use that? The Myers-Briggs is the original instrument that was created from the original theory of Carl Jung. Carl Jung was the originator of the 16 personality archetypes, and he was the originator of the cognitive functions and the fact that we all have a different psyche and we all have a different preference style to different things. Some people prefer to initiate more with other people. Other people prefer to respond. Some people prefer to make moral decisions. Some people prefer to make ethical decisions and things like that. And I think Carl Jung was the person who did a really good job at actually studying the science and creating the whole thing, but he didn't really do a good job in marketing it. Mm. And a couple of decades later, that's when the two Myers-Briggs ladies who created the instrument, the MBTI and the Myers-Briggs to measure Carl Jung's theory so that they can find a way to assess who fits into what category. It's basically a instrument that measures those preferences, those kind of preferences. And the instrument itself isn't so important when it comes to the stuff that I teach because the instrument, like you've noticed, Miriam, is only... 30 to 50% accurate. The instrument is more of a ballpark. So it's really useful when you don't have a clue and you're just looking for a ballpark. But the real science that I use is the original Jungian psychology, the Mm. depth psychology, which is more focused on who you are 
rather than what the test puts you in. So the difference that I explain it is the Myers-Briggs puts you in a box. Jungian theory says that you don't need to be put in a box. You actually need to assign yourself to a box. You don't get put to a box. A box gets assigned to you. So it's completely the other way approach. A lot of you may have taken the test. A lot of you may have taken the 16personalities.com test, which is probably one of the most popular ones. And a lot yeah. of you may have gotten a result. So yeah, it's just a very simple instrument that's supposed to test the human nature. It doesn't measure your human nurture. If any of you is into Enneagram, that measures human nurture. But the MBTI, Jungian psychology test, the human nature, those are your natural tendencies that you're born with, that you prefer, and the ones that make you the happiest if you actually follow, and the ones that work for you the best because they're your natural strengths. And let's just make sure we underline which Myers-Briggs test were you like to refer people to. I think you said it was 16... <sighs> 16personalities.com is the most popular, but it's in my investigation, it's only 30 to 50% accurate. So I'd say take it, see what you get, and then take that as the ballpark, not as the answer. I think once you get the answer, you want to go research and actually find that type and see, well, does that really sound like me or does it not? So what I tend to use is two people's work. I use first Dr. Linda Behrens, that's spelled B-E-R-E-N-S, Behrens. She has a really good type grid that you use interaction styles and temperaments. I kind of shared that with you in Colombia of how to type yourself using those things. My second resource, I have loads of resources, but these are my two men's one. My second one is my personal mentor uh, that has a YouTube channel, C.S. Joseph on YouTube. He uses a lot of Linda Barron's models to type yourself properly. So if you want a ballpark, go to the test. If you want like a proper, more of a definite way to type yourself, I would say you do need a little bit more of a research or you study the type grid by Dr. Linda Behrens. Uh, but that's kind of what I use to type people. In your free Facebook group, which you were telling me about before we hit record, 20knation.com forward slash free group. And we'll make sure that that, as well as the link to the personality types to type yourself yeah. are all in, the sh in my show notes. But in that free group, do you have some of those extra resources for people to like verify themselves? How do they verify themselves with you? I'll definitely have some of those in the group. In 20K Nation, I teach that in more details, but in the free group, they'll definitely have like a basic way to start doing that. Why don't we talk about your personality type? Okay. And also, I love the story about why you started investigating personality yeah. types. <laughs> yeah. Classic. <laughs> so I'm an ENFP. I was in a relationship with an ISTJ which in the personality typing space, it's called the duality. It's called a dual relationship because they're like complete opposites. You know how there's a lot of stories out there saying opposites attract and all of this. And it's really true. Opposites do attract, but there's a couple of types of opposites. My ex and I had the kind of personalities that actually were way too similar in our preferences, they just exhibited in different ways. So for example, we were both extremely rational, extremely good at gathering data and making decisions based on our opinions, but he was way better than me at that. So occasionally, because he was so much more rational than me, he would consider my rationale very inferior because of that. And then on another side, because we are both indecisive, however, I'm the kind of indecisive person who's very optimistic and not insecure about it. Mm. Wow, he was very indecisive, but insecure about it. I would think that him being so insecurely indecisive was very inferior to that. So what was happening is we were in this relationship for four and a half years that was really comfortable. We were talking about getting married and everything. And then one night he said to me in bed, he said to me, I don't think I'm ever going to marry you. For somebody who... His number one need as an ENFP is to be wanted and to be chosen. The fact that he didn't want me in that moment was like completely soul crushing to me. I think that any woman can imagine lying in a bed with her man and feeling that knife going in their stomach. Like you don't have to be any personality type to not like that. That story. It's like, oh, 
Uh, right? It's like he, he could have said something like Do it in the kitchen. Any men who are listening, do not break up in bed. How did no. I know, right? It was like midnight and I So was, you're then what are you gonna not sleep? What are you gonna get out of the bed? So wait, should I get out of the bed now? <laughs> Do we have goodbye sex first? Like, <laughs> we did not. <laughs> okay, right? No. Well, did, did you say, okay, go sleep on the couch? What are you doing here? <laughs> oh, it was more of, I think in that moment, I'll tell you, and I don't think I've ever shared this, but in that moment, I think I got so scared and I was just like, but wait, is there anything I can do to fix this? Mm. Do you want me to lose weight or do you want me to be more of this? Or do you like, I was literally like in that moment, I became so insecure that I was trying to be a people pleaser. I was trying to uh, kind of pretend that I'm willing to do things that are not, not naturally really me. And then he was like, no, I don't think it's got nothing to do with you. I just think we're just not his words were like, I'm not unhappy, but I'm not happy. I don't know if I want to break up. It was just that. So the next morning I woke up, I went to the spa, had a day for myself, had a thought about it. And then I thought, you know what? He is right. We've been coasting four and a half years, no progress. We are just way too comfortable. We were not in love. We were just comfortable. So I decided to break it off. However, after breaking it off, I started feeling really not good enough. I thought, well, maybe if I was like this, he would be with me. Or maybe if I was like this, this wouldn't have broken off. So I really took it to heart. I really took it personal. And in that process, I began researching a lot about my personality type, a lot about his personality type. And I discovered that we had a relationship that was not compatible, but what it's called a relationship that's very comfortable and very common. Mm. So we had a lot in common, but we had no compatibility. Technically, the kind of type he is and the kind of type I am, we are never meant to be together. Like if you're an ENFP and if you're in a relationship with ISTJ, like that is something that it's kind of one of those things you should have never done it in the first place. Or if it mm. was, it should have been a short-term thing. You should have never gotten so comfortable that it becomes a thing because the two types cannot fill each other's blind spots and they're constantly seeking for somebody to fill their blind spots and they're judging each other for being unable. You know how sometimes you're in a relationship with somebody and they expect something from you and you just think to yourself, I just wish I could give you what you want, but I can't. That's a sign of lack of compatibility because the idea is that when you're in a compatible relationship, your exact nature complements the other person's nature and there is no, you have arguments and you can have disagreements, but you wouldn't have blind spots where you can't give each other what you want or you can't give each other the kind of support. Like him and I could not give each other emotional support ever. Like that was something we couldn't do. And I think that's really important. So I became obsessed with it to the point where I realized that it applied to everything in my life. It applied to friendship. It applied to business. All those clients, all those customers that completely drained me, they were all the ones that were incompatible. Yes. And the ones that were compatible were actually very, very... And you know, as an artist, if you spend a lot of time on your own, it's, it's not always so obvious to see, but if you are working around people and you would notice that the kind of people you gravitate towards, some of them, the relationship is so easy. Sometimes you are showcasing your art in front of a room and it's so natural and it's so like just amazing. And then other times it's so uncomfortable and something just doesn't feel off in the conversation. Well, let me just circle yeah. the conversation back just to make this more obvious for artists. So the kinds of relationships relationships that many of us have is sometimes you'll have an art teacher that everyone else loves but it's a bad fit for you or you are the art teacher maybe you have that very difficult art student what is really powerful about what you're saying here is when you understand your personality type then it's not about fixing yeah the situation it's not about fixing yourself it's not about fixing the other person, but it's something we've talked about a little bit on this podcast is you lean into who you are and naturally repel those people who aren't a good fit anyway. But to come from it from a place of understanding that you don't need to fix yourself to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't have to change who you are to be happy. If anything, you trying to change who you are will lead to 
the opposite of happiness. And if somebody can't accept you for who you are, it's a sign that they need another personality type to be around because they're seeking something from somebody who can give it to them, but that's not you. So it just makes a lot of difference when you can, it kind of makes you go, oh, well, that's just the flow that I have and it's not the end of the world. It makes you a little more self-loving. There is also the relationships for artists who have licensing deals. They have to work with a lot of clients. Sometimes if you have a personality type that might not lend itself to that, that that's a type of artist who really needs an agent who can be that extroverted personality type and do the connecting for them. So it's not always about just only doing things that you're good at. It's sometimes yeah. helping yourself figure out, okay, this is not something I can do. This is something I need to find someone else to fill that role for me. Correct. That's the thing. Sometimes it's about not forcing yourself to do the kind of tasks that you know have to be done. Like I am very creative. I am super creative and I am all about big picture thinking, coming up with the vision. I'm amazing at starting new projects, but boy, am I terrible at finishing projects or execution or planning or anything that's an implementing kind of role. So without implementers in my life, including personal and in my business, I will not be able to achieve anywhere near what I do. I'm pretty much the opposite of that. I'm a finisher. And even when it comes to, so my husband loves the crossword puzzle. And thank goodness that I'm not a starter with it because he would be really pissed if like I was always starting and messing with his crossword <laughs> puzzle. But I'm like an amazing finisher with his puzzles. And then of course he gets pissed off anyway because I'll be shouting out, oh, you couldn't get 43 down? That's so obvious. You know, like telling him the answer. But I'm very good at finishing. So the way I set up my business is a lot of times I will have Anna, my assistant, like start the email for me. Like, look, this is the picture. Just throw these pictures in here. This is the subject. Take your first crack at it. Then I'll come in and I'll fix it up and before we send it out. But I know that I'm much better at like doing that work than I am at initiating. That's so interesting. See, that's why we're a good match for both friendships and typically ENFP, INTJ is a very good romantic match as well because of exactly that, because you have somebody who's going to start the things and then another who's going to finish them. Even in the household, it's how it works. Oh, in yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's the same thing. Like I will help my husband out by loading most of the dishes. Uh, actually, that's starting, isn't it? Well, I just don't like to clean the kitchen. That's, that's, that's nothing to do <laughs> with, with, that's to do with <laughs> my personality type. So, okay, we, so now we've come to something else. When, before I met you, I thought I was an INTP because I always thought INTPs, that artists are peas because we're messy. We're just, I'm a little disorganized, a little disheveled, but you're convinced that I'm an INTJ, which I think you've got to be right. <laughs> tell, me, tell me why that is again. Like what, what would be the, some telltale signs of an INTJ versus INTP? So an INTJ is what my mentor always calls the jack of all trades and the masters of all. Like the only type in the world that can literally master anything they set their mind to. While the INTP is more of a puzzle and very geeky puzzle person who is their strength is more around logic and around like an INTP would be like amazing at taking IQ tests like incredible if they ever went to survivor they would crush all the puzzle games and the survivor tv show another thing that differentiates them is INTPs are more visionaries they're more idea people INTJs are more finishers implementers they can create structure and they they need the structure to really, really survive. INTPs don't so much need structure. They just need to be in control of what's happening. They're just like, I just need to have control over the situation, but it doesn't have to be structured. INTJs are more like, I need a systematic approach to get from A to B. The other difference is INTJs are very ambitious. INTPs are more inventors. They're not so driven by achievement. INTPs are more driven by, you know, inventing things and 
while INTJs are more, I got to achieve, I have to be a top performer. I have to create financial abundance. Like they're very much focused on, on that. And then the other thing is the one thing that really gave it away for, for you was INTJs are amazing with aesthetics. Like they dress in a way that you cannot notice that you just go, wow, there's really good fine tuned detail here. And you can see that they put the effort in and you can see that they care. INTPs, they tend to prefer comfort over aesthetics. So they might prefer to wear less makeup. They want put a lot of time and effort into the dressing. Now, let's be honest, sometimes how you dress can be a part of nurture as well, not just mm-hmm. human nature. So yeah. I'm not saying that you want fine, well-dressed INTPs, but typically an INTJ woman would, like you would just see the colors and it would just be like, you won't be able to stop looking at it because it's just so mesmerizing because they're driven by giving others a good experience. And part of that means the aesthetics as well. And also they do have an artist. We all have different sides of our mind. Like we're not like one dimensional human being. So an INTJ has an ESFP artistic subconscious, which, which is really good at actual artsy stuff like some of the best photographers are esfps like taylor swift's an esfp like she's such an artist they have an artist inside of them esfp so intj also has an artist inside that's that's, well that's the thing intj has an esfp subconscious so you can access both of these sides of your mind for different purposes. So that's why if you personally read the ESFP profile, you will find a lot of things that resonate with you there. You hmm. will be like, oh, when I'm extroverted, I definitely show up more like a performer, more of a, like right now, you, one of the things about you on your podcast is you are amazing at giving a really good performance and just making it fun and entertaining and just taking a conversation in a way that's not just uh it's not just oh yeah let's just chat about something right but then to go back to your point i have a very definite structure for the podcast <laughs> you do oh, I right? <laughs> you really do you really do well an intp will be like let's make it up as we go along that's kind of if i had a podcast it would be like that let's make it up as we go along Right. No, I would, I would, that would freak me out. (laughs) (laughs) My listeners don't know what happens before it goes to the podcast editor. And that's by the way, I think that's also what you're saying an INTJ does. I want this very high level experience, very produced experience. So it's not like the Tim Ferriss or Joe Rogan's where it's just, let's hit record for three hours and that's what happens. That's what you get. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think that would be my kind of podcast if I ever had one. It would be just like, yeah, let's just roll with the punches. Yeah, I think I started off trying to do that and it, it wasn't right for me. So yeah. I had to quickly like regroup and say, okay, I'm going to write the show notes ahead of time. I'm going to train my guest on what to do. And it's not that we're reading scripts or anything, but there is a structure that I need in order to let my creativity flourish. So that's what I put in all areas of my life. You were funny at Columbia because I was trying to tell you as an INTP and you're like, no way, look at your lipstick. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, yeah, your lipstick's too perfect to be an INTP. And it's to the women in the room who are INTP. It's not that they weren't fashion savvy, but like I'm thinking in particular, I think Jennifer was an INTP. So Jennifer, she's a brunette, but her hair is naturally curly. Mine was blown out. Jennifer had that very natural look. She just put on moisturizer. You know, I'm there with the fake eyelashes in the middle of the rainforest. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, yeah, that's that's exactly the thing. Remember, an MP values color. Comfort over aesthetics and NJ values aesthetics over comfort. An NJ woman, an INTJ woman, or an ENTJ woman is way more likely at the airport to wear heels. Someone like me, if I could go to the airport and just wear like trainers and sweat sweatpants and put my hair in a bun, I totally would do that, which I have done sometimes. Well, an INTJ woman would dress well, she would play the part. And it's just because they just really love to give others a good experience. So yeah, yeah I know. What if I ran into like my high school boyfriend in the I airport? Know, right? 
that's what I think about. It's sick. <laughs> and I think, well, I might do, but I don't care how I look. Who cares? Right. Every time I go live on Facebook, well, gee, what if, you know, Fred from high school shows, which by the way happened. So that, that's not, you know, on Facebook, all those people creep around. That's why ex-boyfriends should be blocked. But <laughs> okay, let's get back into the personality types. This is so powerful. So how do you help your clients lean into personality types in order to unlock their superpowers? So the biggest thing when it comes to leaning in is to decide and to find out what your natural style of communication, natural preferences for other people to communicate with you and natural strengths and weaknesses that you have. So number one, I always say to them, let's dial in in your strengths. Is your biggest strength working with tools and fixing things together and creating like something with your hands. So a lot of artists would be that kind of personality type that would be really good at with their hands, really good at really good at the detail. They would have, they would be really in touch with their physical environment. So it's like, okay, if that's your biggest strength, then you really have to focus on nurturing that skill even more. So one example, you can nurture your, it's called extroverted sensing. It's your ability to sense everything around you and your ability to be able to really have amazing mechanical awareness. A good way to master that even more is, for example, to sign up to a very intense sports class where you have to react really quickly to a ball, for example. Like tennis is really high intensity and you have to react really quickly. Another example would be if you signed up for a wood chopping workshop where you have to build something out of pure wood, that will really challenge that skill of yours and it would help you it would help you transform the physical environment in different ways. So basically, I teach my clients to double down on their strengths and to really master that. For you, Miriam, your number one strength as an INTJ that you should double in is your focus. Like your number one strength is your focus and being able to see into your own future. Like you are one of the most, what people call intuitive, what they really mean is somebody who can really focus on their own future and who can really see what's going to happen. So for you, one of the things to really double down on is the more focused you can be, the more you can focus on one thing and the more you can really, really, really use that ability to see into the future and have choices throughout the way, the more you're going to be happy. So a big no-no for you would be don't ever tell Miriam what to do. Always. Oh my God. No, like don't you, tell me what to do. <laughs> no. Right. You, know, you always have to give Miriam <laughs> choices. Like, so guys, don't ever tell her, Miriam, you have to do a podcast episode on this. Just say to her, Miriam, would you like to do a podcast episode about A or B? And then she'll be like, oh, I have a choice. So I might do one of them. <laughs> That's how you do it. That's for you. And then my biggest strength is what's called extroverted intuition. And that's the opposite of what Miriam has. So Miriam has, she can see into her own future, but I can see into everybody's future, not mm -hmm. mine. I can't see so much into mine, but I can see the collective unconscious. I'm the type of person that people come to me and I say to them, I told you so, I told you this was going to happen because I can predict mm -hmm. what's going to happen to them. So step one, dial in on your strengths. Step two, once you know your type, you know your weaknesses as well. So I recommend that my clients, not that they avoid their strengths and they put them aside. Like my biggest weakness really is doing anything in the physical environment, but I played tennis growing up to challenge myself. So it's not about avoiding your weaknesses, but this is what it is. If you have to do it for work, if you have to do it in your career, if you have to do it in any way, if you can outsource it, you would do a better job. Example, part of being able to be really good with your hands also involves being a good designer, right? So I prefer to outsource my designs to other people or my website to other people because they can really design something that looks better than I can. So I always say to my people, try to outsource your weaknesses 
and don't try to force yourself to do them because they will burn you out. I have this saying, this is a quotable. Burnout has nothing to do with how much time you spend on something. Mm. Burnout has everything to do with what you spend your time on. Yeah, you know, one thing that I've been struggling with right now, not struggling, wrestling with is a decision on whether for the next launch I have coming up. Well, actually, by the time this airs, it'll be in the rear view mirror. I would have done it. <laughs> you get to see the future. So one of the things I'm struggling with right now is with writing every single one of those emails and the sales page. And I was wondering, well, gee, I mean, I'm really good with the strategy of the Facebook ads and planning the timing of the launch, but it kills me writing all this copy. So you think I should be outsourcing that, huh? So ideally, you should either outsource it completely or you should at least outsource the structure so that somebody can start the copy for you and right. then you can finish it, right? Right. And by the way, INTJs are amazing at copy. They really are naturally because you're naturally aware of what other people think. So you can right. utilize your knowledge of other people's thoughts to do that. But again, not a great starter. You right. want to have other people start things for you so that right. you finish them. So, so yeah, like, temp thing, like working with templates then, that's a better model for me. And basically for you, it's like not forcing yourself to start. That's going to be one thing. Like don't force yourself to start things. Just accept that that's not where you thrive. That doesn't mean you always need somebody else to start for you, but it means you'll be happier if you have somebody else always starting for you. Yes. So. Okay. And then one thing I'd also want to circle back on you were talking about that I definitely have been using lately, so thank you, mm -hmm. is I've signed up actually a bunch of clients for my artist incubator program. It's my small group coaching program. And when I was talking to people on the discovery calls, what the conversation that I had with them was that we talked about their emotions and how their emotions were holding them back. But I said, but my strength is in the strategy. So once you know what to do, you can be calm and not let those emotions get in your way. They don't know where they should start or they, they keep spinning because there's so much and they don't understand with the strategy of marketing. I said, it's kind of like if I just said, go into the kitchen without a recipe, without a cookbook, and now you're going to bake a cake. How does that make you feel? Uh, it's not so good. But how do you feel if you can bring a recipe with you? Well, then you can do anything. You can do a tray leche cake for crying out loud. Like you have a recipe, you just follow it. So that's what I say, you know, I'm going to give you these recipes and these strategies so that those emotions that you feel don't get in your way. But it's not that I'm working with them on their emotions. It's just the strategy helps them not have to worry, not yeah. have to have those emotions get in their way. Isn't it nice to be able to say to people, hey... Just so you know, emotional support is just not my strength. And I will always care for you because I care about all my clients. But if you ever need the kind of emotional support at tough times, I might not be able to express that. So I need to tell you that up front so that you know what you're signing up for. And isn't it so freeing when you're able to say that and not say it as of like, oh, I, I know I suck because of it. But it's more like, hey, this is just what my strengths is in strategy, not in emotion. It's not good or bad. But if you didn't know that about yourself, like if you didn't know you were an ITJ and if you didn't know that you are not naturally good at emotional support, you might be a person who might be giving emotional support and burning out as a result of it. I think that's one of the reasons I was burning out in my old relationship because I was giving the emotional support out and I am not good at that either. I am a total strategy and big picture thinker as well. And by the way, this also works with parenting. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. We had this client of ours. What we do is some of them who they can't verify themselves. We offer a service where we verify people and we verify their kids, their husbands without them being there. We just ask them questions about them and then we kind of see what they are. And we had this customer of ours who had an INTP son and she was an INFJ she couldn't get him to do anything. Like she couldn't get him to clean his room. She couldn't get him to do his homework. It was just so chaotic. And we said to her, listen, 
he's an INTP. The only way to get an INTP to move is to guilt them. Like, you literally have to guilt him. And she's like, oh, my God, but I really hate when people guilt me. And it's like, yeah, you have to do to him exactly what you hate being done to you. So she started calling him unhelpful. She started saying, oh, you're so unhelpful. You're this. And then he started doing his room and he started doing everything. She came to me and said, Katya, ever since you told me to guilt my son, he's become so compliant. It's actually crazy. Like- That's amazing. I love that. Can you put- personally type my children and tell me what to do (laughs) we totally can do that Miriam we totally can do that we're doing that for all our people that want that so (laughs) all right so I loved having you here it's so much fun meeting you in Columbia neither one of us went on the rainforest part so what did you do the last two days when you were there We ended up going to this 13 course meal place that was incredible. I am all about like food experience. Mm. I'm just such a foodie. So we ended up doing that. And then we ended up going and spending some time with some friends who were there local. It ended up being very, very chilled. Let's just say that. I don't regret not going because I was injured. Everybody told me I did the right decision. So, uh, but let's be honest, if you guys are listening to this and you ever go to Colombia, maybe, yeah, it is not a bad idea to go to the rainforest if you physically can. I skipped the rainforest because I did want to sleep in a hammock. I thought that'd be uncomfortable. I was worried about getting a hot flash in the middle of the night. <laughs> falling out of it, getting eaten by a monkey. Mosquito. But, right. but meanwhile, it's not like I was any more comfortable on the plane ride home. Like I was thinking that, uh, gee, I, I could be in a hammock right now. I'm not sure that, you know. <laughs> so what I did on my last day though, was I hired a driver, which is not expensive there because the exchange rate is crazy favorable mm-hmm. to us. He took me to the plaza where all the Botero sculptures are. And then there's a museum there because uh, Botero is a, a very well-known Colombian artist who's still alive today. He was born in Medellin and he's been donating lots of his artwork to the city to make it more of a cultural center. Yeah, I did that. And then I also went to the Botanical Garden for lunch where I had, I know you're a foodie, so where I had chilled avocado soup. Wow. Oh my God, that was so good. Wow, that was incredible. I, I wish I could tell you the, the names of the 13 course I yeah, had. Yeah, that's asking. What was your favorite thing? You oh know. my God, I don't know what it wasn't. What was it not? Maybe my favorite thing was when he brought one of these cold ice, you know, when it, just the whole thing explodes. The whole room got covered in uh, in smoke. It was like, what's happening? What's happening? <laughs> it was it was just a really good experience. Oh, and the meal started with washing your hands with pure <laughs> chocolate. So they wash your hands in chocolate. Then they sprinkle coffee and sugar on it and you wrap your hands. And then they get you to lick your fingers before your meal to experience the Colombian coffee. So that was cool. That is cool. That's <laughs> That's really cool. All right. <laughs> Next year, I'm doing that, (laughs) bringing home those souvenirs on my thighs, which I kind of did anyway. (laughs) Right, the cocoa con queso. Did you have that? The chocolate? It was hot chocolate with cheese. It was so good. Everything was so good. All right. So let's wrap up. If you want to find Katya, she has a free Facebook group. It's 20knation.com forward slash free group. So she has a lot of resources in there. And your membership site, I believe it will have just closed when this airs. But how often do you open that? We open a couple of times a year, but if people go to the website, the20knation.com, they can just check out the wait list and they can get notified when that's ready. But we probably will reopen again in a couple of months time. So Okay. So check out the free group and see what you can learn there. Thanks so much for joining us today. What would you like to add so we can call this podcast complete? One thing... I really, really want to make sure that people understand is that using your personality type and being more of who you are is not about, it's not about being a rebel for the sake of being a rebel. It's not about showcasing how different you are. It's not about making others understand you. It's more about understanding yourself, accepting yourself, and then 
The other thing that I love about it is that once you understand others, you actually stop feeling resentment towards them because you can always understand another person's point of view if you actually understand their type. It makes life much easier. It makes those moments of, I'm so annoyed, so much less common because you will always understand where people are coming from. I truly believe that what I'm doing and the work I'm creating and the stuff that I'm sharing can truly be a vehicle to a 10% better world peace, 20% better. Because if we all got along, then a lot of the problems in the world wouldn't be around. So don't be afraid to express yourself. And as a creator, don't put too much pressure on yourself to be this super organized, crazy, structured, crazy planning person because a lot of you creators out there love to be free-flowing. And in fact, if you are not capable, if you're not able to free-flow because of somebody trying to constrain you, you probably might not be able to create. So allow yourself to be that person and allow yourself to develop your own style, allow yourself to not judge yourself and allow yourself to not try to compare yourself to other people, especially people who are nothing like you. I love that. All right. So lean into compassion for everyone else, for their types. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time. Don't forget, we have included links to her website and Katya's Facebook group in case you want to work more with her. And we also will be including the personality type quiz. And why don't you do this for us on Instagram? What's your Instagram handle, Katya? At Livestream Katya. So that's spelled L I V E. S-T-R-E-A-M-K-A-T-Y-A, Livestream Katya. Okay, so we're going to put that in the show notes as well. Why don't you tag us and let us know what your personality type is? Yes. We would love to hear from you. Okay, everyone, thanks so much for listening. Make sure you're subscribed to my podcast. That way you'll be notified every time I have a new episode. Thanks so much for being with me here today. I will see you same time, same place next week. Make it a great one. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Inspiration Place podcast. Connect with us on Facebook at facebook.com slash shulmanart, on Instagram at shulmanart, and of course, on shulmanart.com. Don't forget this episode was sponsored by The Artist Incubator. It's my small group coaching program where I help you take your art business to the next level with practical strategies that work. Imagine what it would feel like to be easily selling your art and profiting from your passion. 